Amen. And good evening, folks. Welcome to the Bible study in the book of the Acts of the Holy Ghost, as we've been calling it. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Amen. Uh, before we dive in, Father God, as always, we approach uh, this time uh, with great expectation. We know that uh, as we feed on what is called the sincere milk of your word, we will grow. Uh, and we thank you that that growth opens our eyes and hearts more and more and more to the depth of your grace and love and mercy towards us and further helps us understand the purpose for which you've called us as a congregation, you've called us as individual people, and called us as members of your body. And we just give you great thanks for that in that precious and matchless name of Jesus. Amen and glory to God. Uh, so tonight here with chapter 18, I believe it is, uh, we're going to meet some interesting folks. Uh, we're also going to see kind of a really interesting facet uh, in terms of how the Lord can use our frustrations to actually direct us in the path he would have us go. And that's actually connected uh, to this question. Uh, we're going to see a little bit further on uh, that Paul developed some frustration. I mean, really frustrated. Uh, and in the midst of his emotional reaction to it, you're going to see the Lord actually move him in the direction that the Lord wants him to go and to bring to forth what had been intended all along. And so, uh, these experiences that we see of folks in the Bible, they're not unlike how the Lord uses us. Same Holy Ghost, right? Different circumstances. And so uh, the question to think about as uh, you listen and as we walk through the story, how does the Lord deal with you and your frustrations to help you persevere towards accomplishing whatever it is the Lord has you? So if there are things of that nature that you like to share, that'd be great. Otherwise, of course, when we get to question and answer time, uh, again, feel free to raise any comments or questions about anything we've talked about tonight or anything uh, in this especially in this first 18 chapters, all right? So let's have a listen, and then we'll dive in. Chapter 18. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit, and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment, and said unto them, Your blood is upon your own head. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And he departed thence, and entered into a certain man's house named Justus, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. For I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. When Gallio was deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Gallio said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names, and of your law, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat, and Gallio cared for none of those things. And Paul after this tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Sincrea, for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus, and left them there. But he himself entered into the synagogue, and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry at longer time with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. But I will return again unto you, if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea, and gone up, and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he departed, and went over all the country of Galatia and Philia in order, strengthening all the disciples. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. 
This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them, and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Amen, indeed. So uh, you heard that uh, one reference there in terms of Paul's frustrations. There are also a lot of other interesting things. Um, you, you heard also the vow that Paul had taken, Paul keeping the feast. In chapter 19, we're actually going to get even more in-depth in some of these areas. Uh, there is, uh, you know, as we've talked all along, a growing understanding by all of the disciples and apostles in terms of what in our Old Testament, so to speak, uh, ways of approaching God carry forward with uh, into, this, into this new covenant, uh, what things get left behind, they're no longer applicable, and what things kind of change form. The principle is still there, but those things change, change form. And this is always, you know, that, uh, that delicate balance. And Paul is grappling with a lot of these things. Uh, we've talked all along about, you know, the travels that Paul has gone on uh, in terms of this, uh, this, uh, the beginning of this final uh, missionary trip. Uh, the trip that he takes to get him here, first off, he started out in Troas and he goes to Philippi. That distance, um, mostly by sea, there's some land travel, you know, once you cross over to Macedonia, apparently, is about 310 miles, uh, roughly speaking. And then from there, Paul is going to make the trip down to Athens, uh, which is roughly 410 miles. And as you can see, uh, that's a combination of land and sea travel. If you were to take the land travel, uh, you know, it's obviously significantly longer, probably half a uh, 50% longer, 600 and some miles, uh, if he went in that direction. And then when he gets to Athens, he's going to cross over a pretty short distance uh, across uh, uh, Athens uh, into Corinth. And so overall, just in this small portion of the trip, they are traveling somewhere around close to, let's say, 800 miles. And just think of travel in that day. And so it's really uh, kind of an ardu arduous journey. There's all also important, uh, let me go back. Um, actually, gonna, sorry about this. I wanted, I wanted to make a comment here uh, about this portion. Oh, I have that later. My bad. Oops. <laughs> I know to see this stuff flash is annoying. Sorry about that. I, I got ahead of myself. So anyway, uh, at the beginning of this, Paul meets Aquila and Priscilla. They uh, end up being two really instrumental people uh, in terms of the spread of the gospel. We know a fair amount about them. Uh, one, as it tells us in Acts chapter 18, they both, uh, the couple were tent makers like Paul. I've always, whenever it mentions Paul's tent making, um, I, I have mixed feelings about this. I'll, I'll just tell you a brief story about this. Um, you know, as you know, Pastor Reed and I have both been employed, uh, you know, outside of pastoring since we started pastoring. We were employed then and just continued with our, our you know, our call to ministry. Um, I've been an independent consultant. Pastor Reed has worked in academia and in education uh, and is still doing that. And when we were ordained as pastors, um, other pastors basically would not accept us as pastors because we weren't quote unquote full time. And I was like, it's not full time? Kind of what does not full time look like? The notion was that if you were doing something other than pastoring, then you weren't a real pastor. This is, and this is in the early, uh, early 1990s. Uh, and we were just kind of perplexed by that. You know, certainly um, when a congregation gets to a certain size, it's too big a job to handle, uh, you know, if you're doing other things and your attention is divided and, and perhaps even your motivation is divided. Uh, but, you know, Global Truth Ministries and the predecessor churches have always been small enough to be manageable, under 100 people. Uh, and because of the flexibility, particularly that I had, uh, I could always and always have put ministry in front of business. Um, and so there was never any real conflict. And it's always been full time because you don't say, well, yeah, folks, I can't do anything, you know, this particular time I'm doing something else. Uh, and so it, it always struck me that when you look at the biblical model, uh, they all had another job. They all did something else to basically fund the ministry pretty much as Pastor Reed and I do now. We've never uh, used ministry as our main source of income. We do get a really nice housing allowance 
from Global Truth Ministries. Come to the town meeting. You'll find out exactly how much it is. And it basically helps with our mortgage. That's about it. But we've never done ministry for the financial part of it because it's not what we do. It's kind of who we, we have become. Um, I've always found, interestingly enough, uh, that also being a tent maker has had tremendous advantages, you know, particularly, um, you know, when you and I have had conversations about difficulties in the workplace and things of that nature. I, I feel you. Pastor Rita feels you. Uh, she is directly involved. And I'm as a consultant, always on the outside. But I think engaging in what's going on in the world has added more to our ability to minister than taken away. And so I've always marveled at the fact that all throughout the scriptures, there's, there's no one at this point and at no point down the road uh, that they weren't doing something else to supplement uh, their income. And so uh, Priscilla and Aquila, just like Paul, were tent makers. They made tents and sold them. And that's what uh, financed the ministry. They are really two remarkable people, as I said, and they become very instrumental in the ministry. Uh, in 49... Um, A.D., the Roman Emperor Claudius expels all the Jews from Rome. This goes all the way back really to, uh, to Nero uh, because ultimately they blame this disastrous fire on the Jews, uh, on uh, the fire in, in Rome on the Jews. And 20 years down the road, Nero's persecution begins at that point. So there's always been this antipathy. Uh, with Rome, very threatened again by the presence of the Christians. And so Priscilla and Aquila uh, were with that group of Jews who in 49 with Emperor Claudius pre preceding Nero were expelled from Rome and they end up moving to uh, living in Corinth. Uh, they worked and traveled with Paul uh, in Romans uh, chapter 16. As you can see there, he called them his fellow workers in Christ. Uh, keep in mind, you know, we have perspective on titles today, right? When we think of biblical roles and responsibilities, we're very uh, siloed, right? It's, you, you, you're this as opposed to that. And as you've seen throughout the book of Acts, uh, different people have multiple functions. You can be an evangelist and a deacon at the same time, no conflict. And so there is some reference in terms of the words used that Paul describes Aquila and Priscilla really as part of the apostolic team. They're looked at as apostles. You're going to see another person, Apollos, who we'll meet a little bit later on, who is described directly by Paul as an apostle. Apostle simply means a sent one, uh, someone with a particular mission to accomplish, uh, separated from kind of the general mission uh, of being, uh, you know, a part of the body of Christ. It is not, you know, any higher or deeper or more anointed than any other function in the body of Christ. Everyone in the New Testament who is in a position uh, is called a deacon, diaconai, a minister, someone who serves the needs of others. And so this notion of a hierarchical mentality in the New Testament is very hard for us to read it if we maintain that mentality. Everybody is a servant. Everybody is doing the diaconai. Uh, the roles, responsibilities, again, will differ. Uh, but there's just not that, you know, hierarchy. Jesus talked about this, you know, in, uh, you know, in the Gospels. He said, this is how the Gentiles do it, right? The Gentiles lord it over people. They put themselves in, in control and they tell people what to do. And he says, it's not like that in the kingdom. Uh, he says that the person who is supposed to be in charge is actually going to be uh, the biggest servant. And Paul, uh, again, I think provides such an incredible example of being an apostle of such renown and has such an unbelievable impact on the world's history and his humility is always present. So again, just a great example in terms of the difference between the way we think about roles, responsibilities, functions in the New Testament compared to how we think about them in our own culture. Um, Aquila, uh, the husband, was originally, as it says, from Pontus uh, and also uh, again, was a Jewish Christian. He very early on in the process uh, recognized through his understanding of the scriptures that Jesus, the Messiah. Later on, Paul makes him a bishop in Asia Minor. Again, the word bishop, we have a different definition of bishop. It's almost like it's a special role. Bishop is an elder. It's just the difference between two words. There is the word episkopos, uh, that we get the concept of Episcopal from, and that's a bishop. And there's presbyteros. We get the word Presbyterian. So Episcopals, Presbyterian, uh, they're both words that describe elders. And the words are just mirror images of the same function. Uh, the notion here 
uh, is that bishops and elders basically um, are responsible for larger groups of people. And so what happens over time in church history uh, is that elders, uh, the Episcopoi definition, they tend to be in charge of congregations, uh, of one congregation of some, of some size, where bishops end up being in charge of an area where there may be multiple uh, multiple congregations. And this is not the biblical definition or the role of Episcopos or Presbyteros. It's simply the practical problem that the church had as it started to grow. It had to manage this growth uh, in a very authentic way initially, just to make sure, as we've seen, that everybody understood what the gospel was about, what they should do, what they should not do, and just, uh, again, all of this uh, being revealed at this time. And so, uh, ultimately, um, Paul put um, uh, Aquila and Priscilla, Aquila, in the main role uh, of that responsibility. I say Aquila in that main role uh, because a lot of times in the in Acts, you will see Aquila and Priscilla or Priscilla and Aquila. Generally speaking, whoever is named first is the more is the lead person, not more important, but the lead person, right? So Aquila ends up being kind of the lead person when it turns to organize, organizing uh, and managing congregations. Priscilla, his wife, is the lead person when it comes to teaching. Uh, and so they have this dual role and responsibility, quite equal and quite even. Uh, but again, um, as it says there in number five, um, Aquila ends up being a bishop in Asia Minor and one of the first, one of the first uh, appointed to take charge of uh, these larger areas and larger congregations. Priscilla is a, of Jewish heritage and uh, apparently one of, uh, again, got in very early on in terms of accepting Jesus um, in, uh, when, they, when they lived in Rome. Uh, she is, of course, uh, one of the first examples of female preachers or teachers in church history. And of course, you know, as we've talked about quite a bit over the years, this is one of those just ridiculous sticking points in the body of Christ. You know, women can't do this, women can't do that. And what you see it with Jesus and what you see with Paul and the other disciples is women do whatever men do. There's just no distinction whatsoever. Uh, and it's a real shame that when people raise that issue, uh, they're not looking at all of the facts that you see and, and clearly the roles and responsibilities that people have. So yes, there are, are women apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and any other role or any other responsibility. Keep in mind uh, that they are coming out of, unfortunately, the rabbinic approach to these things, which even though the Old Testament does not forbid women from having any kind of responsibilities in, 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 uh, in, in church and religious matters, the laws that are added to it really do inflict an awful lot of distinction and a lot of bias against women. And so the Old Testament and believers in general get blamed for being, you know, uh, against women in roles of responsibility, where the Bible, Old or New Testament, never has any of that prohibition. It was the culture of the day that reinforced those things uh, in some really terrible ways. Uh, and, and you can hear that all throughout the New Testament, and you can hear and see Jesus and even Paul, again, break some of those unfortunate habits. Um, as well as, uh, you know, being some of the first converts in Rome, Priscilla and Aquila uh, would be, in our modern day language, uh, identified as some of the earliest Christian missionaries traveling from place to place. Uh, there, there's some of us like, like myself who's going on missionary trips, the longest maybe for three or four months. I've never, you know, had the opportunity to actually pick up and move and live in another country uh, as a missionary. Uh, that is just an unbelievable responsibility. Uh, the missionaries that we travel with when we went on our several mission trips to other places uh, were just unbelievable people. Um, I always came back from those mission trips determined to one, appreciate the comforts of the United States and the ease with which I could practice my faith and, and you know, exhibit publicly uh, my belief in Jesus Christ. Um, as well as recognizing how much more I needed to grow and how much more the Holy Spirit wanted me to grow in terms of my commitment to the ministry. Not the commitment to being a pastor in the church, but my personal individual commitment to being a believer, right? I've never had any issues with 
the role and responsibility. But, you know, we all grow. And, you know, how much Jesus do we want? How, how far do we want to go in terms of accomplishing God's will? And uh, thank God for grace and mercy. Amen. But they were, again, one of the first to actually do that role. Um, in verse 24 and through 28, we'll get, uh, we'll get there later. Luke talks about the couple explaining Jesus' baptism to Apollos. Apollos is going to figure in very mightily. And again, he's going to be the person that we'll see that the Lord brings in to the work that needs to do. We'll get to that in, in, in a bit. Um, Apollos is a evangelist in Ephesus, right? And Paul later on also indicates uh, that Apollos is an apostle. And you'll see why, if you didn't pick up on it uh, in the reading of it, exactly what is it that Apollos does that ends up putting him in that role of being a sent one, a special messenger and a sent one. And so when Paul uh, gets together with Priscilla and Aquila, uh, he stays with them in Corinth for about 18 months, uh, a little bit more than a little bit more than a year and a half. And so it, his habit always has been, you know, to go to the synagogue and to share the word. And so this is that point of frustration, right? He is in, the, in one particular synagogue and he's sharing the gospel and it's just not landing. Uh, you know, the, the, the Jews who are listening to Paul, they have all kinds of objections to what he's saying. And you get the impression that, um, that he's not really even allowed to provide answers and to respond to questions. It just, they're, they're not willing to hear it. And it's not that it isn't landing as much as they're actually objecting and disagreeing. Uh, and it gets to a point of frustration, right? And he basically tells them in so many words, well, fine, have it your way. End up in hell. I don't care. I'm going to go share it to the Gentiles. And, and I'm saying that specifically in that fashion because a lot of times the biblical language is in such a way that it undermines the level and depth of emotion, right? Paul gets completely and totally, he loses it. And he says, I don't care what happens. Now I'm done. I'm tired of this. Every time we go to the synagogue, I got to put up with this nonsense. And he reaches that point of frustration. Human being, right? And he says, I'm going to go ahead and take the message I have to share to the Gentiles. Well, unfortunately, um, the uh, the Lord has really good plans for Paul, no matter what he does. Uh, he's staying at Justice's house. Justice is house is next door to the synagogue. Kind of like, uh, think of it, um, you know, in, in some uh, large churches where there's a parish house where the ministers have a place to live next to the, to the church, so to speak. So he's staying at Justice's house, which is next door, uh, Crispus is the caretaker of the synagogue. You're going to see um, in these last several chapters when it refers to folks in the synagogue, people were referred to as the head of the synagogue. I had to do a little bit of investigation of that because I thought automatically that the head of the synagogue was referring to the rabbi. And it's actually more like the custodian. Uh, the person who's in charge of opening up and closing and making sure everything's set and organized. So Crispus, and you're going to meet Sosthenes a little bit later, they're referred to. And then uh, there's another uh, a head of the synagogue we'll meet uh, before we get towards the end. Uh, so when it says head of the synagogue, they basically are the custodial person in charge of making sure everything goes effectively, right? And it runs well. Uh, and so Crispus is the, the caretaker of the synagogue. Um, he stops by. And it says that his household and many of the Corinthians standing by got saved and were baptized. And so you can, you can see the Lord actually forming the clarity of his use of Paul in much more concrete terms. Paul gets really frustrated that the Jews won't listen. He's going to go to, this, go to, the, go to the, uh, the Gentiles. And as he gets to the house of justice where he's staying, he doesn't go there to preach or teach. Justice actually interacts with Paul Paul shares the gospel with him, and then the people who are outside around the place listening, they hear it, and they want to know more. And so even though he's frustrated, the Lord already has things set up for him. And you're going to see how, again, this unfolds even more as we go throughout. And so uh, uh, Crispus's household and many other Corinthians standing by get saved and get baptized. Um, in his frustration, and this is this is why... I love the Lord, and I know you do too, because he's there and knows. You know, he's right in the middle of the situation. He doesn't say, hey, Paul, man up, man up. You were called. I chose you. Get there and do your work. That's not what happens. 
in his frustration, the Holy Spirit comes and says, don't worry about it. Stay here in Corinth. Nothing's going to happen to you. I got a lot of our people here watching out for you. So just stay the course, son. Hang in there and do the work that you're called to do. And he gives him the word to stay in Corinth, keep preaching, and he's going to be safe. It's it's close several times. You know, he does run into some difficulties, but at no point in time in Corinth does Paul actually uh, suffer any negative consequences. But you know, the Lord's right there with him in the midst of his frustration, and as opposed to chiding him or criticizing him, you know, for losing it, he says, "I understand what you're doing is hard. It's difficult. I appreciate the work that you're doing. Hang in there. I got you. We're going to get through this." And so that gives him the emphasis to stay for another 18 months. He continues to do the work that he's called to do for 18 months. And so um, a little bit later on, uh, there is a new mayor who gets appointed in Corinth. And that gives them now the opportunity once again to see if they can do something about Paul. They're, they're, the problem they have, of course, is that the gospel is seemingly to them contrary to the Torah. And again, the Torah is uh, the outward description of the inner spiritual reality. Even Paul, you know, he makes very complex statements, right? He says the law is good. He says the Torah is good. He's not, but he's not saying, of course, that all of it applies and we should still be doing it. That's just, it's not true. You know, the vast majority of all of the customs that were necessary, particularly the entire sacrificial system, which has got to be, you know, 90% of what the Torah is all about is no longer even applicable. Uh, and and what, what Paul has discerned that you and I have discerned is that the Old Testament paints a picture that the New Testament accomplishes. I, I've, I've never, and maybe it, it, was the, it was my church experience. I don't know why, but I've never seen any conflict what I have seen, of course, uh, are traditional points of view that make the God of the Old Testament a whole lot more angry and frustrated than the God of the New Testament. And knowing that God doesn't change, yeah, there's some, there's some contradictions and conflicts in our mind, but those are born of our religious traditions and not what it actually says. Um, in our morning prayer, uh, as most of you know, because I keep bringing it up, it's been such a life changer for me. Um, in reading through Jeremiah, we, we've seen nothing in Jeremiah but the grace of God. We've seen nothing in Jeremiah but the Lord pleading, don't do this to yourselves. And if you do it to yourselves, I'm still going to be here. I'm still going to love you. Well, if there's that much of that grace and mercy in the old, my goodness, how much more are we experiencing it in the new? Um, and so the, the narrowness of interpretation is the problem here. And they are accusing Paul again, of just preaching that is contrary to everything that we know and everything that we have been about. Uh, but unfortunately, the new mayor has a different uh, way of thinking about this. They bring their case to the new mayor, mayor Gallio. We need to do something about this guy. And he's like, well, what's the problem? And they explain what Paul is doing. And his response is, if you were charging this man with a crime or some other wrong, I would have to listen to you. But since this concerns only words and names and your own law, You'll have to take care of yourselves. I refuse to judge such matters. He basically says, I don't have a whole lot to do with this. It, 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 when you hear that, it does harken back uh, to a lot of the issues that Jesus, you know, had to deal with. A lot, a lot of the, the, you know, activity there where whether it was uh, Herod or Pontius Pilate, at some point they're like, this is, this is y'all stuff. This has nothing to do uh, with what we're all about. And this is why as we go further in Acts, um, the Jews who want Paul stopped, they have to basically make the issue that he's preaching a doctrine contrary to the emperor of Rome. That's the only thing that they're going to care about. Whatever you, you Jews do, go ahead and take care of it. It's not something that we're going to concern ourselves with. And in their reaction to that, uh, the Corinthians turn on Sosthenes. I remember I mentioned him, uh, who seems to be the same position as justice in another synagogue, and he gets beaten by the crowd. Uh, they have just such a reaction that you bring up all this nonsense and disturbing the peace of Corinth. So not only uh, is the Lord's word to Paul uh, correct that he's going to be safe, but all these other folks 
uh, suffer pretty negative consequences, again, for disturbing and creating all this difficulty and all this drama. Uh, and so Paul stays about another six months or so in Corinth, and then he heads to Ephesus. Uh, that trip uh, from Ephesus, Ephesus to Corinth, really across land, 1,100 miles. That's a long, long, long way to go. Uh, but he is, again, uh, heading back towards ultimately to Antioch, Antioch in Syria, which is another 1,000 miles. So 2,100 miles to go uh, on his way back to home, uh, which, again, we're going to see him turn around and head to Rome because of the events that take place. Uh, everything changes as we go forward. Um, I, this is what I was going to mention before that I thought was in the, in the, in the first part of, uh, of, of the teaching. Um, we always have to differentiate um, the breadth of the work that Paul is doing depending upon where he's at, right? So for, him to, uh, for them to say Paul is going to go to Philippi, is one thing to say uh, he's going to Galatia is another thing. And it has to do with the difference between cities and regions of the country. So it would be the difference between me saying, I'm going to go minister in Alexandria. Well, that's fairly well defined, although it's pretty big, as opposed to I'm going to go minister at, in Prince William. So the difference between a relatively good sized city versus a huge county. Uh, and so when Paul goes to Galatia, He's going to lots and lots and lots of different places, uh, many, many more, more than likely when he's going to a smaller town. And, and I, I, I was thinking about that when reading this over again in terms of all of the activity that we don't hear about. Obviously, Luke can't document every single day's activity. He's only hitting some of the highlights. But in between that is lots and lots and lots of travel, lots of interactions with lots of people in different congregations, particularly with Phrygia, Galatia, their regions, as opposed to Ephesus or Troas or Philippi, which, again, are large cities. Uh, but again, much smaller in uh, in terms of, of the area that he has to cover when he goes to minister in those places. Um, and so right after this, um, the scene switches back to Ephesus uh, when Apollos has his meeting with Aquila and Priscilla. So you recall previously that Apollos was identified as an evangelist, uh, as someone that was really well versed in the scriptures and the difficulty uh, was that Apollos had only been saved by the baptism of John. He had not heard the gospel. All he heard was what John said was that, behold, the Lamb of God who's going to take away the sin of the world and that Jesus was that Lamb and that he was the promised Messiah. That was it. That was enough to keep Apollos and a bunch of other people going. Uh, I think it's going to be in, in, in chapter 19, we run into some other people as, as Paul's traveling around, and Paul says, have you received the Holy Ghost when you learned about Jesus? And they're like, we didn't know there was a Holy Ghost. And then, of course, Paul shares with them, the, you know, the understanding of the Holy Ghost. I, I bring that up because I just find it remarkable in terms of how powerful the Spirit of God is in terms of directing us towards what he wants us to accomplish in spite of what we know or don't know. Apollos is missing how much, 80% of the rest of the story? <laughs> but he knows enough to connect with the presence and the personality and the reality of Jesus. T to me, there's another message behind that. And that message is that I think our culture, I, I don't think, I know our culture, has placed too much value on the importance of knowledge and education and spiritual things. And I'm the last person to say that you shouldn't educate yourselves. You should read, you should study, you should learn the languages, you should drink as deeply in the well of God's spirit as you possibly can. But that has nothing to do necessarily with the Lord's ability to use us in accomplishing his will in some really significant ways. And I know a lot of us, particularly, you know, those of us who had grandparents and great, great parents who didn't, didn't weren't very well educated, but they knew Jesus and they know Jesus enough to have made a difference in the lives of folks around us. So I'm all for learning and study. You know that I, 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 I enjoy that more than, than probably anything else, but that's not necessary 
to accomplish God's purposes. It's necessary to develop a deeper understanding of things. But if you just met Jesus, that's all you need to know. That, that's all that it takes. And uh, Apollos is a great example. Uh, and so when Aquila and Priscilla uh, meet Apollos, Paul says, hey, this dude, take care of him. <laughs> you know, he's got something. He really knows what he's doing, but you need to fill him in on the rest of the story. He, he, all he knows is what John said. And so uh, Priscilla and Aquila, uh, they basically take Apollos through a you know, Bible study class and help him just connect all the dots. And then this is, what's, this, is, this is where it comes full circle. After they explain the gospel to him in a more accurate manner, here is what the record says, that Apollos mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. The Lord already had someone being prepared to be effective in sharing the gospel to the Jews. It, it doesn't mean that Paul's time and energy was wasted. Some plant, some water, God gets the increase. It was clear though, and Paul understood this from the very beginning. You know, he, he was told this from the very beginning that his ministry was going to be to the Gentiles. But his attachment to the Jewish people uh, because of the role he played is something he couldn't deny. And so, you know, as we've seen, every time he gets a chance to minister to the Jews, he's going to do it. And he reaches this incredible point of frustration. And it's that point of frustration that God uses to now shift him in the direction that he's supposed to go and raises up the person who's supposed to be doing the thing that Paul uh, had started to do. And so it's just kind of a remarkable story. Uh, and it's remarkable because uh, this isn't Paul figuring things out. This is him just doing what he thinks makes sense for him to do. The Lord's smiling and nodding and saying, that's good. Don't worry about it. We'll get it worked out. And in the midst of his incredible frustration, uh, the Lord moves Paul in the direction he should go. And again, brings up the person to do the gift. Indeed, amen, makes room for itself. All right. So with that, uh, we'll open it up for any questions, um, comments, anything you want to discuss. Again, you certainly can address this question as, as you want, but don't necessarily feel that you have to do that. So anybody have anything they want to share, questions or comments? Anyone? Pat or John, go ahead. Oh, Pastor, I was um, talking to some people the other day, and and this person told me, you know, for some reason they like people are drawn to you. Yep. I'm like, okay, why? And they couldn't explain it, and and I heard it from three other people, and it just say it, it's just something about you. We're just drawn to you. And I'm like, kind of I'm stand there and I look dumbfounded. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. is, it be, is it because um, certain things I say, because sometimes I can be blunt and I have a nickname of being Johnny Blunt. Johnny Blunt. And I'm like <laughs> trying to figure it out. And I, you know, I, I can't figure it out. So I just sit back and I think about the things that I do, the things that I say. And how I talk to people and how our conversations might deal with a lot of things. And and I just like, well, this is how I look at it. And sometimes I put what I believe in God in it. And I'm like, maybe that's it. But I can't put my finger on it. And I'm like, it, it, it still puzzles me, but maybe one day, my father would tell me what it is. I doubt if he will, because once you know it, it might go to your head. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> I think he's going to keep that a secret, bro. <laughs> Maybe, but uh, I don't think I'll let it go to my head. You probably won't. You probably won't. Um, you know, a, a, a lot of us have those experiences where we, we, we can't figure out what it is that God is doing with us that's effective uh but i've always understood it to be 
the world is dark. Uh, a lot of people are like moths flickering around and we're the light. And they're just naturally drawn to the light. They don't oh, know George. why. Oh, they don't know that. why. They're drawn to the light, you know. Uh, it's hard. It's hard. To, it's hard to say. It's really hard to say. Uh, Pastor Rita in particular has that um, in public when we go places, we can be anywhere. And I'm just like, it won't be long now. Somebody is going to come up and start a conversation. And the next thing you know, here is an opportunity. I don't necessarily have the same effect on people. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, some, some in a lot of situations, there's just something uh, coming from us. Something is emanating from us that's deep calls to deep. And people are drawn to that. So amen. Amen. Thank you yeah. for sharing that. Not surprised. Amen. Anyone else? Any others? Yeah, someone in uh, in the Rochelle's household. Who's that? Go ahead. Um, Rochelle. Hey. Um, just had a comment. Um, was taking in everything that you were teaching and saying, and was saying to myself, I just really wish people would dig into the scripture and really get an understanding when you were explaining about um, really pretty much um, none of us being um, of any perspective in the sight of God as far as the male and female thing. Yeah. Because I know people who, um, of course, put the male up on a pedestal, so to speak, and they will not attend churches, whereas the female is has a title of a pastor. And I'm like, what? I, yeah. And it's just really sad when you think about it, because I've always said, as long as somebody teaching or teaching the truth, I don't care if it's a monkey. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> truth <laughs> is the truth. Truth. I mean, it just for people to get that prejudice, I mean, because it's a prejudiceness. And they don't see it that particular way. And I'm like, well, what difference does it make? And oh. why? Because this is not what scripture says that only men can have that title. And I understand too, as far as how people can misuse and abuse titles. Yeah. But um, it's just really interesting how that has actually been pretty much. Um, embedded into the minds of people. Oh my but goodness. I think that um under no circumstances can a woman be a pastor. I mean, yeah. I, I know people that no matter how much you try to explain that to them, that they think otherwise, you can show them scripture, et cetera, et cetera. It, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter. It there. does not matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You can read it to them in the original language and show them the examples and give them a logical argument. You know, and it doesn't matter. A bunch of years ago, Pastor Reed and I did a a wedding uh, in a in a church. Um, it's a large church, large denominational church, um, African American church. I won't give you the name because uh, you know I don't want to badmouth them. But we did the wedding there, right, in their church. And the uh, one of the one of the um, the the bride, the the groom, was a member of the church, and the uh, bride was a member of our church. And so we did it in the groom's church and they had, they had a raised platform, right? And they had another platform down below it. The raised platform was the minister's platform. And this was kind of where, you know, the deacons and anybody else could sit. Pastor Rita was not allowed to do the wedding from up here. She had to stand down here because women were not allowed on the minister's platform. And we did the wedding to us together with her talking from down there and me talking from up there. Wow, isn't that something? Unbelievable. I'm I, I give her so much credit for the grace she has had over the years in putting up with a lot of that nonsense. Because that's not the that's the that's one example of many, many times where, you know, she's not even acknowledged, you know, uh, as a minister. Um, in some places. So it's, it's, I, I don't get, I mean, I do get it. I do get it. I just, but like, I, like you said, I wish people would just read the book, just read the book, read the book. Amen. Yeah. Pretty, pretty really. It's, I mean, it's really sad and I don't know what's going on. Well, I do. Cause we look at time. <laughs> yeah. But, but it's so much of that 
nowadays, you know, just talking to people and, and their beliefs, um, I mean, and against that so much, they use that as such an argument. And I'm like, why yep. would you cause something like that to even cause you division? Right. Um, you know, from people and in the body of Christ and so forth. It just it just doesn't make any sense. But then it tells a lot about the heart, you know? Yeah, it does. It it does reveal a lot about the heart. Amen to that. Thank you for sharing that, Rochelle. Even though it got me worked up. <laughs> I don't like people picking on my wife. <laughs> Anyone else? Pat or John again. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, everyone. It's hey, Pat. Pat this time. Okay, so that what Sue Rochelle said brought up something. And, you know, I've been working with my colleague. Um, and the other day, we really came to a blow. Um, because he's really, I don't know what happened to him in the Catholic church and, but he really like, uh, kind of came, became very confrontational because I mentioned the word, we were talking about something and I was like, uh, what was it? Uh, I was like, yeah, well, if, if I'm blessed to have another four years and he just went off on a tangent. What do you mean you blessed that or that? So I was like, I don't know what happened to you, Tim, but I don't know, you know. <laughs> so to make a long story short, I remember the um uh before I got to really saying a whole lot with him, I remember that portion in the Bible and even with in children church where if you're and I think it's in Luke somewhere where you're talking and they don't want to hear it. Yeah. Then you just go on because uh pick up my just pick up your bed and walk, I think is one shake the dust. But I, up real, I remember in Luke it says when he was talking to the disciples of how he was saying, if you go to a house and they don't want to listen to you, then something would happen with their house or something like that. But I just and I decided that. I'm just going to leave it alone. I'm not going to bring anything else up to him anymore because yeah. I don't want to be combative with anybody. You yeah. know, yeah. He, yeah. something happened. And I told him, I said, something happened to you in the Catholic church that has really darkened you, yeah. whatever it is. I don't know what it is. Well, you know, they believe so much in Mary and they think Mary is, you know, they pray to Mary and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, you know, I pray to Jesus. So You're like, yeah, that's my point, uh, right? I'm trying that's what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> yeah. 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 So uh so I don't know if I have any more stories to tell you about him. I think it's done. Well, you planted a big seed. If, I if, did, if the hopefully. seed if the seed was big enough that he got mad about it, that's a big seed. You should be you should feel good about that. That's hard to do. Okay. <laughs> big seed. If he got mad, it's it, something. Something got to him, right? Mm -hmm. Something. Got yeah. Him. I, I've never met the guy. Know nothing about it. I can only go from prior experience. When people get that at get that agitated about something they don't believe, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. That's, really? What? Why is it bothering you? You'd be like, "Hey, okay, yeah. Tell me all about Jesus. I I don't believe that, but you're you're he's right. Still, he's still. He still goes back to the babies and the this and how can he let babies die? And look at what he did to this for so. Uh, yeah. So I don't know. Could have could have been something, but you know mm -hmm. you're planting that seed and him getting stirred up. Um, that that creates the opportunity for someone else maybe to come from a different angle, from a different hey, perspective, yeah. and water the seed you planted. So, good work, well done. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thanks for sharing that. Anyone else? Yvette, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. <laughs> so I think uh, for me, I see it as a um, a trust issue because um, when we get frustrated, we don't have any control. And I, I guess I, I saw that with myself and the Lord had to deal me with that. It's like, I wanted to, it was more of a, I want to do this. I want to do it this way and that. And I had to learn that 
it's I'm not my own. And there's somebody else that is telling me, which is the Holy Spirit telling yeah. me what I should be doing and I need to listen. Yeah. And when I started listening, instead of trying to do it in my own right, things changed. Amen. And 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 it's, you know, then you're not, you know how the scripture talks about um, just to pray and don't be anxious and you know, the Lord knows and so forth. And I, I see that. And I see, I think that's a lot of people have lost trust because there's so much garbage out there, so much nonsense and stuff. And so there's that apprehension of, is that true? You yeah. know, like you said, got to get in the word to know yeah. that what's true or not. I can see that when, when you, when you say it in that way about it being a matter of trust, I was mm. just article a few days ago again about why people are leaving denominational churches mm -hmm. and it talked about the fact of how um, religion in general call it religion it makes us open up and mm -hmm. be vulnerable yeah. and that's exactly what you're 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 reminding me of right it's a trust thing and when that trust gets broken you know yep it's harder uh, to get them to open their heart again really hard it hurts you know it gets yeah. your feelings hurt you know right Kids, they get their feelings hurt. They yell and scream and kick. We don't get to do that. Right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so we just pull back, you know. Uh -huh. Pull back. Great insight. Thank you for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Amen. Amen.